Boy, that Sharon Brown something else, isn't she? <laughs> it's a real joy and a privilege for me to be here and to be the kickoff speaker for the university uh, program this year. I want to express appreciation to Paul Lasso, Bruce Meyer, and Beth Vanderwilt especially. But I also want to express my deep appreciation to Scott Truax, to Pat Drinan, and to Sherry Riggin. Sherry, of course, is the president of Greater Muncie Habitat for Humanity. Pat is the president of the campus chapter here at Ball State. And Scott, of course, is Mr. Habitat at Ball State. Tonight, <clears throat> the theme is the same as it will be all week for University, and that's touching home. I don't think you possibly could have chosen a more appropriate theme when you're thinking and talking about shelter, and especially when you're thinking and talking about habitat for humanity. A university is a place where ideas are shared, where learning hopefully takes place. And certainly Ball State is known throughout the nation as a place where ideas are valued. And university is a time, a specific time, to share ideas. And tonight, it is my privilege to be here and to share with you what I think is one of the most powerful ideas that is in the land today. It's the idea that everybody who gets sleepy at night ought to have a decent place in which to sleep on terms they can afford to pay. The idea of Habitat for Humanity has been called radical common sense. I think that's a pretty good way to describe what this work is all about. Habitat is radical because we have a goal which, simply stated, is to eliminate poverty, housing, and homelessness from the face of the earth. I think there would be few things that you could espouse or few things you could aspire to that would be more radical than to say that you want to work toward having a world in which everybody has at least a simple, decent place in which to live especially if you know in any detail at all what the world situation really is like. A hundred million people living in uh, the out of doors with no housing whatsoever. Well over a billion people living in grossly substandard housing. Right here in our own country, the wealthiest nation on the face of the earth somewhere between 300,000 and 3 million people living in the streets, over 30 million people officially poor, and much of that poverty is caused by substandard, inferior, pitiful, despicable living conditions. And for anybody to seriously propose that you're going to completely change all of that, and have a nation and have a world in which there is no substandard housing and there are no homeless people is incredibly radical. And Habitat is also radical because of the method we have, the approach that we take to solving this problem. It is what we in Habitat call the, the Bible finance plan. The idea of charging no interest and adding no profit and largely using volunteers to build the houses. The concept of enlisting college students and churches 
and civic clubs and other local grassroots people all across the land and all around the world to solve a truly humongous problem. What could be more radical than that? And yet it is the ultimate of common sense that everybody who gets sleepy at night truly ought to have a decent place in which to sleep. And so Habitat brings that radical and that common sense and puts it together and you have Habitat for Humanity. We have several concepts in Habitat which are very central to the way we work. First of all, we believe in building simple houses, simple, decent houses, but substantial, solid, sturdy houses. That is very central to the way Habitat operates. Another very central feature in our work is what we call sweat equity. We believe that what the poor need is not charity, but capital. They need co-workers, people who work with them. We don't build houses for people. We, will, we build houses with people. And that's why we insist on families who receive Habitat houses working themselves and helping to build that house, putting hundreds of their own hours of their own labor into building the house. That is done for several reasons. It's done for a very practical reason of helping those families to gain very practical skills on how to maintain that house once they move in because people on limited incomes are not able to go out and hire somebody to replace shingles that have blown off. They are not able to go out and hire somebody to fix a hole in the wall that Junior busted uh, with his uh, basketball or with his uh, foot or whatever. And there's another reason, and that is we want to give the people who are going to own that house a sense of psychological or spiritual connectedness with that house. And that is, that is achieved by the people actually helping to build that house so that when they move in, they don't just get a piece of paper which says they are now a homeowner, but they feel it within their heart that they have a connection with that house. It is truly theirs because they have helped to build it. This idea of no profit and no interest, which is so central to Habitat, comes out of the Bible. The Bible teaches in Exodus 22, 25, for example, and in many other places, that if you lend money to the poor, you should not charge interest. This is God's plan for allowing those who have fallen behind economically to catch up, to have a place to live on terms they can afford to pay. And Habitat for Humanity is an organization that is openly and unashamedly faith-driven. We say we are a Christian organization, not a new denomination, neither Protestant nor Catholic. We are not an organization with some sort of new and unique doctrine. We have always seen ourselves as a servant of the church, not a church, but a servant of the church, and we have the concept of welcoming everybody who would desire to participate as a volunteer, as a contributor, and certainly as a recipient. We have a, what we call a non-discriminatory family selection uh, policy, which says that neither race nor religion should be taken into consideration when choosing families. Need is the criteria. Seeing if a family has uh, a living situation which is substandard for whatever reason, overcrowded, rent too high, leaky roof, caving in floor, whatever the reason might be, if it's a substandard situation and they don't have enough money, again, for whatever reason, to get conventional financing, then they can be considered to be chosen to be a Habitat homeowner. And neither race nor religion is considered in making those choices. There's also another dimension to Habitat for Humanity, which is very central, and that is we have always seen ourselves as working worldwide. We have the idea that the earth is the Lord's and all of the inhabitants of the earth are of equal concern to the God who created us all. And so we not only work in Muncie, Indiana, 
and in 29 other cities throughout Indiana. We not only have a campus chapter at Ball State and nine other colleges and universities throughout the state of Indiana, but Habitat works in 38 countries around the world, and our goal is to have Habitat houses being built in every single nation on Earth. Because, as I said earlier, our goal is to completely eliminate substandard housing from the face of the earth. And our method of doing that is to link those habitat organizations in the developed world, such as the affiliate here in Muncie, with projects in places like the Mescatal Valley in Mexico, or Belo Horizonte, Brazil, or in Lekais, Haiti, or Kamam, India. And we ask the affiliates in places like Muncie to give a tithe of the money that's raised to help build houses in these developing countries. Because with 10% of the money that's raised locally, we can build the same number of houses in a developing country, or in some instances, two or three times as many houses with the 10% that we build with the 90% in a developed place like Muncie or Indianapolis, Chicago, New York, or wherever in the United States, or Canada, or Australia, or some other developed country like that. The economics of Jesus is a central policy, a central uh, feature of Habitat for Humanity. I've already mentioned the uh, aspect of no profit and no interest, but the economics of Jesus also means that we believe in taking limited resources and asking God to bless those limited resources, and in a miraculous way, they get multiplied. The miracle of the loaves and the fishes uh, give us an example of these kingdom economics, where Jesus took the five pieces of bread and two fish and blessed them and delegated the responsibility to the disciples to feed the multitude, and it was not only enough, there was and abundance. There were baskets full left over. And it's also the idea that we see in the laborers in the vineyard, where those who started to work early in the morning and those who started to work in mid-morning and noon and mid-afternoon and late in the afternoon all got paid the same. That in God's order of things, there is no such thing as connecting up productivity with receiving the basics that are needed in life. We don't believe in this concept of the deserving poor. We believe that being alive makes you deserving. And that if you're alive and you get sleepy at night, as a human being, you ought to have a decent place in which to sleep. And so Habitat for Humanity follows these economics of Jesus or biblical or kingdom economics. Another thing which is very central to Habitat for Humanity is what we call the theology of the hammer. Now, this concept of the theology of the hammer means that we in Habitat believe that it's not good enough to just sing about love and sing about faith and talk about love and talk about faith, but you have to put it into practice to make it real. Jesus never said, the first commandment is this, thou shalt go to church, thou shalt sing songs, thou shalt develop a ministerial tone to your voice. And he never said, thou should try to get other folks to go to church or go to Sunday school and develop a ministerial sound to their songs. And he did not say that in order to be an inspired, Holy Ghost-filled Christian, you've got to learn how to say, Jesus and God. <laughs> but rather, Jesus taught that we should seek God first, serve God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. We should love and be concerned about the other person in practical ways, just as much as we are concerned about and just as much as we love ourselves. It's not that we should not go to church or it's not that we should not study and have prayer sessions. All of those kinds of things are important. But the theology of the hammer tells us that we've got to put all of that inspiration and motivation and understanding of God's Word that we get in these places where we gather ourselves together, we've got to put it to work in practical ways. There's also another dimension to the 
theology of the hammer. And that is that we people of concern, we people of love and compassion and faith, we realize that we differ. We differ theologically. We differ philosophically. We differ politically. We come conservative. We come liberal. We come Democrat. We come Republican. We come confused. But we believe that all of us, no matter what state we might find ourselves in, re theologically, philosophically, religiously, politically, or whatever, the theology of the hammer says we can work together, we can use the tool of Jesus, which was a hammer, and we can use that tool to build houses, to renovate houses, to repair houses, to let the world see that we who disagree on so much can agree on something that is so little which can make such a profound difference and the world can see that we folks of love and concern and faith can agree on something and we can make a witness and we can build thousands of houses to the glory of God and for the benefit of those in our respective communities who need a place in which to live on terms they can afford to pay. Now, we in Habitat who do not see ourselves as a church, we in Habitat who don't have doctrine, except the doctrine of putting the theology of the hammer into practice, proclaiming the gospel of Christ by building and renovating simple houses, we do have one doctrinal point which is very important. And I hope all of you are listening very carefully when I tell you what that doctrinal point is. It's simple but yet profound. If you do not have a Habitat bumper sticker on your car, you are living in sin. <laughs> I've been amazed throughout the day as I've gone around Muncie how many sinful cars there are in this city. <laughs> and so many of them are right here on this campus. It is appalling. It is alarming. It is... Uh, a great sadness to me to see so many cars that have fallen so far. And I'm going to count on you to redeem those automobiles. <laughs> In Habitat for Humanity, redemption comes cheap. You can get your bumper stickers out back for just a few pennies, and you can correct that deficiency. Now, everybody always laughs when I say that, but you know, they tell us, people who know about advertising, they say, a Habitat bumper sticker or a bumper sticker that promotes whatever is worth $1,000 a year for whatever it's promoting because a bumper sticker is the most seen advertising there is. You cannot fail to read whatever it is on the bumper in front of you because there's nothing else to do while you're waiting on the light to change. <laughs> and somebody else also said, a person only puts on their bumper what they really believe in because they know the whole world is going to see it and your back is turned while they're reading it. <laughs> I want to spend just a few minutes and tell you briefly about the history of this idea, this grand idea, which is Habitat for Humanity. I realize that some of you here know some of the history, perhaps Many of you don't know very much about it, and I'd like to put us all on level ground. The tap root of this idea is at a small Christian community near Americus, Georgia. It's a community called Koinonia Farm. That community was started 50 years ago this year. In 1942, two Baptist preachers went to rural southwest Georgia with a radical idea that God is no respecter of persons. And they started an integrated Christian community in the heart of the Deep South. One of those Baptist preachers left within a couple of years, but the other one remained. And the one who remained with his wife Florence was Clarence Jordan. And I know that a lot of you here tonight have heard about Clarence Jordan. He became quite famous in his lifetime for his cotton patch translation of the Scriptures. He was a man who believed in relevant religion. He believed that religion which remained relegated into the distant past was truly 
an irrelevant influence on society. If we only talked, for example, about Jews and Samaritans, when the real problem was between white and black, then it was an irrelevancy. If you went into church and you talked about the good Samaritan and the good deed that he did 2,000 years ago on the road between Jerusalem and Jericho, and you didn't make that relevant to the situation you lived in, then the whole thing was almost an exercise in something that was, that was worthless, useless, a waste of time. So he was a person who really believed in relevant religion. And Linda and I got to know him. We went there at a time of personal crisis. We were nurtured. We were ministered to. We were healed spiritually. And then in, in a way that we felt very much was, was a leading from God, we created with a small band of other concerned people a movement which when we first started it was called Koinonia Partners and one of the aspects of that ministry was what we call partnership housing. We saw so many people in our immediate area there in southwest Georgia who lived in substandard housing and we realized that most of these people lived on somebody else's land. They couldn't go to the bank and get a loan. Even if they could get a loan, they couldn't get any land. They didn't have a job that paid enough uh, money for them to pay an interest-bearing payment to the bank. And we said, somebody ought to do something about this situation. How can we say, we reasoned, how can we say we are disciples of Christ? How can we say that we really love God and, and love our neighbors as much as we love ourselves if we go to bed every night in a real nice house and we see these neighbors out here going to bed in a shack that leaks, the floor's falling in, got an outdoor toilet if they're lucky, got a well if they're lucky, and if they're not so lucky, they don't have any well, they don't have an outdoor toilet, and they're living in truly pitiful conditions. And so we set up a fund for humanity, and we announced that we were going to try to build a decent house for everybody in Sumter County, Georgia. And we were going to use this radical Bible finance plan, no profit and no interest. Well, as people learned about this idea and we laid off 27 lots, I'm a lawyer by profession, but before I went to law school, I, I studied engineering for a couple of years and I learned how to survey. So I personally went out and surveyed off the first 27 lots. And in a small town and county, everybody wants to know what everybody else is doing. So they would come over and say, what are you doing? And we said, we're going to build some houses. They said, yeah, we see you getting ready to do something. You're making these lines here, and looks like you're laying off some lots. Who are you going to build houses for? We said, we're going to build houses for the poor people. They said, the poor people? Uh, we said, yes. They said, how are you going to make any money off of those folks? Uh, we said, we're not going to make any money. Not going to make any money? Then how come you're doing it? We said, we're doing it because we've been reading the Bible. They said, you've been reading the Bible. Yes, we've been reading the Bible. Well, what's that got to do with it? The Bible says we are supposed to help one another. Yeah, we know that. But that's for Sunday school and church. This is Thursday afternoon. <laughs> we said, we think you're supposed to put that all into practice on Thursday afternoon. They said, you've turned into a religious fanatic. Anyhow, they said, no profit and no interest. It sounds like a communist scheme. Well, there were a lot of doubters, but we started building the houses, and we worked there for nearly five years. We put up about 30 houses, and the idea was working. People were donating money, giving us non-interest loans, and we were building these houses, simple, modest houses. People were helping us build them, and it seemed to be catching on. So Linda and I decided we wanted to see if we couldn't test this idea in a very different place, so we came to Indiana. We didn't come to Indiana immediately to build houses, but we came up here to meet with officials of the Christian church, Disciples of Christ in Indianapolis. And they agreed to support us to go and work in Zaire, the old Belgian Congo. So we went to Zaire and worked for three years and we built houses there. We started 114 houses in the capital city of Equator region. Then we went to the southern part of the 
region and started 300 more houses in the village of Tondo. And then 16 years ago, we came back to the United States and we officially organized Habitat for Humanity. And we told our friends and our neighbors down in Sumter County, Georgia, our goal has now changed. We intend to eliminate poverty housing in the world. Uh, we realized it would take a little longer, but the idea was the same. We continued to build every year. More and more cities came on. Uganda and East Africa decided uh, to join us, and they started building habitat houses. I went to Central America and visited in Guatemala, and we set up a program there to build houses. And we started in Beaumont, Texas, and Immokalee, Florida, building for the migrant workers, and in the mountains of Tennessee. And over a period of time, we added more and more cities, both in this country and in other countries. By 1980, we were building in 11 cities in the United States and three countries abroad. And that year, we built 120 houses. In 1984, I went to see one of our neighbors, a peanut farmer who used to be president of this country, Jimmy Carter. He lives about nine miles from America's where we live. And I went and asked him if he would get involved, if he would help us. And he and his wife, Rosalind, agreed. And his first project was to work in New York City. We went there in the summer, the late summer of 1984, and we worked on renovating a six-story building for 19 needy families. And every year since, the Carters have gone to another city every summer and have blitz-built habitat houses. As a consequence of that, a lot of new people have learned about Habitat for Humanity. They brought a lot of visibility uh, to the work. Well, over a period of time, people began to ask me, uh, why is it that you only have Jimmy Carter in Habitat? Why, why, don't, you have, why don't you have some Republicans? I, we don't like Jimmy Carter. He gave away the Panama Canal. Uh, we had double-digit inflation under him. He let all these people come in to Miami from Haiti. How come you got him in there? We want, we want some Republicans. And I would always say, we've got Republicans. Habitat is not uh, a democratic organization. It's a Christian organization. We welcome people from all kinds of, of uh, persuasions, all kinds of political backgrounds. Yeah, we know, but we want to see a visible Republican, somebody that's well-known, like Jimmy Carter. And I said, I'm looking, I'm looking. <laughs> and I continued to look. I continued to look, and finally, I found one. His name is Gerald Ford, and he used to be President of the United States. I found him in Rancho Mirage, California. Linda and I went, and I went out to see him. We had an, an appointment with him. He received us very graciously. And we had a nice meeting in his office with the uh, president of the local Habitat affiliate, Clarence Spear, the president of Coachella Valley Habitat for Humanity. And President Ford said, I think Habitat is one of the greatest organizations in this country. I think everybody ought to get behind it and support it. I encourage everybody to support it. I think it's a terrific organization. I said, Mr. President, would you say all these nice things publicly? He said, yes, I would be glad to. Good, I said, I've got a press conference right outside your office. <laughs> well, he came out and we had the press conference set up with the TV cameras and the radio folks and the newspapers. And he did, in fact, repeat himself publicly. He said, I think Habitat's a great organization. It's not a political organization. I encourage people of whatever political persuasion to get behind it and support it. But he said, I want to make one thing clear, and that is I cannot be another Jimmy Carter. I don't have those skills. If my wife gives me a nail to put up a picture, I bend it. I just can't do that. I don't know why, but I just can't do it. I said, Mr. President, I got good news for you. Habitat can use anybody. Even a totally unskilled person, such as yourself, can serve, can serve as a bad example. We'll put you on the site and you'll be the designated bad example. Well, he wasn't sure he wanted to serve in that role, 
uh, but he was willing to become an official advisor of Habitat for Humanity, and we appreciate his support. More recently, and I think a lot of you have seen this on the television, or you've seen it in the newspapers, that uh, Governor Clinton and Senator Gore came to Atlanta on August 19th, and they worked on a Habitat house. They worked there with Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. I was present. We really worked. We put up a whole house in about five hours. We closed that thing in. We started off with the foundation, and when we left at noon, we started at 7 o'clock in the morning. When we left at noon, it was closed in. The doors went, the windows went, the roof was on, and the house was closed up, and we locked it up. And all we had to do then was finish uh, the inside work uh, for the family to move in. But anyway, because they worked there, I got a lot of letters from folks saying, how come you let Governor Glenn work? He's a Democrat. Well, you know, we don't like this. And I'd always write back to them, and I'd say, hey, he worked. Senator Gore worked because they showed up. If President Bush and Vice President Quayle had showed up, we'd have put them to work. And in fact, we did invite President Bush and Vice President Quayle to work out in Houston during the Republican convention. So the point I'm making is that Habitat welcomes whoever shows up, whether they are Democrat, Republican, whether they are Baptist or Methodist or Protestant or Catholic or Christian or non-Christian or Jew or Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim, whatever, we welcome whoever shows up to give help because we have a big challenge and a big task before us and we need the whole crowd behind it in order to accomplish what we feel God has given us to do. Now I want to share with you briefly what's happened in recent years with this uh, idea which started off so small of building one house for one needy family in rural southwest Georgia. Tonight, as I am speaking to you on uh, Sunday evening, the 13th of September, 1992, Habitat for Humanity is working in nearly 900 cities. We are building houses in all 50 states in the United States in a total of 748 different locations. We are building an average of 17 houses every day. The sun never sets on the work of Habitat for Humanity. It took us 15 years to build the first 10,000 houses. We built that 10,000th house last year in April in Atlanta, Georgia. We put it up in 14 hours. It took us 15 years, as I said, to build the first 10,000. We built the next 5,000 in 14 months. And so on Saturday, June 20th of this year, we built the 15,000th house in Evansville, Indiana. We now expect and are planning to build the 20,000th house next April in America's Georgia, and I'll talk about that a bit later. But we will build the next uh, 5,000 houses in 10 months. By 1994, we expect to be building 10,000 houses a year. And within a very few years thereafter, we will double that number. We are trying to make shelter a matter of conscience. We are serious about completely eliminating substandard housing. We know that Habitat alone cannot do it, but we know that we can build, and through groups like the campus chapter here and Greater Muncie Habitat for Humanity, we can build thousands and tens and, yes, hundreds of thousands of houses. But more importantly, we are injecting into society this idea that everybody ought to have a house, and that is eventually going to precipitate aggressive action on the part of government, aggressive action on the part of the 350,000 churches in this country, the many more hundreds of thousands of churches around the world, civic organizations, businesses and foundations to get behind this idea. And with everybody working toward the solution of this problem, it can and it will be solved. So we are experiencing a dramatic growth, and increasingly we are having an influence in society. I've always seen Habitat as being in the nature of yeast. You know, just a little yeast in the, 
in the, in the dough makes all the difference in how the bread turns out. And we see the idea of habitat being like yeast, and we're injecting it into society. And even though when you consider the enormity of the problem, it is a, a small number, but we are having an influence far beyond the size that we are. Recently, I know that all of you have been aware of the violence that we had in Los Angeles, in Atlanta, in Las Vegas, and in the surrounding area of Los Angeles. We set up a Justice and Righteousness Fund to respond. We raised over $600,000 in about four weeks. Habitat increasingly is, is able to respond to those kinds of situations to go in and work with the existing affiliates to make an immediate and direct impact on those kinds of situations. And then Hurricane Andrew hit just a few weeks ago. I was down there last Wednesday and Thursday. There's utter devastation. We have a Habitat affiliate in Miami. We have one in the Upper Keys. We have another one in Broward County. We have one in Immokalee. We have one in Palm Beach County. We have six affiliates in the South uh, Florida area. We're in Lafayette, Louisiana. We're in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And that hurricane went over all of these affiliates where we had built a total of 150 houses. Some of the houses were right under the eye of the hurricane. You know how many of them got damaged? Zero. Not any habitat houses were seriously damaged by the hurricane. As I travel around, people say to me, oh, these houses are built by volunteers? You, you mean college students build these habitat houses? How long do they stand up? <laughs> I love to tell them about what effect the hurricane had on those college student built houses. A few shingles were blown off and a few windows were broken, but every single habitat family that was living in a house before the hurricane is still living in that house. Not a single one had to leave their house because of damage caused by the hurricane. The Bible has something to say about building on a rock so that when the winds come and the rains come and the floods rise, the house will stand. And the habitat houses in this hurricane were like a parable from the Bible. And I know those houses stood not only because they were love and faith built houses, but for the simple reason they were just well built. We did not and we do not cut corners in Habitat for Humanity. That is an important part of the economics of Jesus. Our inspiration is Jesus and he never half healed anybody. He took care of the job right when he put his hand on someone. And when we in Habitat touch a home, we want to touch it in the same spirit that Jesus touched people and do it right. And that's why I'm so proud of what happened to those houses, or more correctly, what didn't happen to those houses when those high winds hit them from the hurricane. We have now established the Hurricane Andrew Fund. And we wrote out letters two weeks ago, and we asked our people to send contributions so we could come right behind the relief efforts. Habitat is not a relief organization. We are a development group. And we come right behind the people who are getting them intent. All of that relief work is incredibly important. But we are not a relief organization. And we don't come in to do relief work. We come right behind the relief people to build permanent houses. And so we've asked our friends to send contributions or to offer to volunteer to work. And I know that some of you Ball State students are planning to go down uh, over Christmas or next spring break and work. But we mailed out our letters last week. And, la and this pa immediate past week, we were receiving over $400,000 a day from people sending in contributions to help. We raised over a million dollars in one week, and we've already committed that million dollars to South Florida and to Louisiana, and we expect to generate several million dollars to help in the massive process of rebuilding both in South Florida and in Louisiana. Habitat is also experiencing dramatic growth in the campus chapters. We've experienced a, a historic first here in Muncie this weekend where we celebrated the fifth anniversary of the Campus Chapters program. It was on November 30th, 1987, that I went to Baylor University in Waco, Texas. The, the chaplain there, Dr. Gary Cook, 
had invited me to come with the, he said, we need to have a campus chapters program of Habitat. And I went not knowing what to expect, and 2,000 students came out to the meeting. And we formed the first campus chapter on November 30th, 1987. So this year is the fifth year. And we gathered here in Muncie yesterday, 200 students from Ball State and nine other universities. And we worked on five houses, and they will continue to be worked on throughout this coming week. And we hope to get them as far along toward completion as we possibly can. From that one chapter five years ago, we now have grown to 300 campus chapters in the United States. And we also have a campus chapter at Suleiman University in the Philippines and another one at Technology University in Ley, Papua New Guinea. And this past week, I was in Saskatchewan at Saskatoon at the University of Saskatchewan, and they intend to be the first campus chapter in the nation of Canada. Our goal in Habitat is to be on every college campus by the end of this decade. That's approximately 3,000 colleges and universities in this country, and we want to be on at least 500 other campuses in other countries. And another historic thing is just underway right now as I speak to you, and that is two chapters of Habitat for Humanity are being formed at two different prisons in the state of Illinois. So that will be a new dimension of our work when we start prison chapters of Habitat for Humanity. To accomplish what we want to accomplish in this work, we realize we have to dramatize our cause. And this fifth anniversary uh, event here at Ball State this weekend has been one such example. Last year, we had the 15th anniversary celebration of the movement of Habitat for Humanity. We observed it in Columbus, Ohio. Some of you were there. We had 6,000 people for our main event when Jimmy Carter worked. We've had walks. My wife and I have led walks from Georgia to Indianapolis. Our first one was from America's Georgia to Indianapolis, Indiana, nine years ago. And then in 1986, we led a walk from America's Georgia to Kansas City, Missouri, 1,000 miles. And then in 1988, we led a walk from Portland, Maine to Atlanta, Georgia, a distance of 1,200 miles. We raised $1.2 million and built 154 houses along the way. We involved approximately 30,000 people in that particular event. We dramatized the cause. We challenged more people uh, to get involved. And we are continuing uh, to organize these kinds of dramatic events, like the one leading up to Columbus last year when we organized blitz building prongs from 15 different points around the perimeter of the United States. And for 15 weeks, we blitz built our way to Columbus building hundreds of houses along the way and involving tens of thousands of people. This coming April in America's Georgia, we have one of our most spectacular projects planned. It's called our 20, 20,000 project. We are going to build 20 houses in five days. And the 20th house is being designated as the 20,000th house built by Habitat. And that 2020,000 project is a part of a larger effort, which we call the Sumter County Initiative. That's the home county of Habitat for Humanity. And we feel that it is only appropriate that we do in our home area what we are proposing for the whole world. When we started there a little over 20 years ago, half of our population lived in substandard housing. We've already, through Cornelia and Habitat, built approximately 300 houses. We've got about 500 more to build, and we're going to build all of those houses between now and the end of the decade so that we will completely eliminate all substandard housing in our town and county by the end of the decade. And then we are going to use that as a, as a demonstration plot, as a model of what can be done everywhere. If you can do it in a remote corner of southwest Georgia, which has incredible, which has had a history of incredible poverty, so many of our people living in substandard housing, then surely you can do it in Indianapolis, Indiana, and in Muncie, and in Marion, and in LaPorte, and Fort Wayne, and anywhere else that you put your hand to the task. Another very exciting thing it is doing, and, and this demonstrates how we in Habitat believe in having fun. In Charlotte, North Carolina, which is our biggest affiliate, this past week they built their 150th house. They've got over 100 churches that are cooperating in working with Charlotte Habitat for Humanity. 
But they pioneered a little over a year ago the first all-women-built house. No men allowed. They had Rosalind Carter there for the first couple of days, and they invited my wife Linda to give the dedication speech. They wouldn't let me say anything except to introduce her. And while they were building that house, they made one exception for the men. They said the men could come and serve refreshments and meals, but nothing else. And the women did everything. They did all of the electrical work, all the plumbing work, all of the roof trusses, all of the walls, everything. They wouldn't even allow the building inspector on the site unless he had a wig on. <laughs> and now this idea has caught on. It is amazing how it has caught on. In Minneapolis, Minnesota, for example, and I was there just this past week, they put a little notice in the paper, we want to build a house with women, an entirely women-built house. Please come to a certain address on a certain date, and they reserved this room and expected 35 or 40 women, maybe, if they were fortunate, to come and say, we want to help. 400 women showed up. They came with their tools. They wanted to start that night. And they said, hey, you got to raise all of the money to build this house. They raised enough money within a few days to build three houses. And they are now working on it. And they came up with this incredible, ingenious ad, which they ran in the paper. It's a picture of a construction belt. You've seen a construction belt, you know, a leather belt that uh, builders wear, and they've got their squares in there, and they've got their hammers in there, and they've got the saws in there, and everything's, all these construction tools are just stuffed down in this construction belt. And the caption for the ad reads like this, women, it's time to put on your aprons. We've got housework to do. <laughs> so Habitat is all of this, these dramatic projects with this goal of eliminating substandard housing. But really, Habitat is people. It's people touching people. It's touching homes and the lives of those who live in those homes. I flew here to Indiana, uh, Indiana two days ago from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I met with the Habitat affiliate there. Habitat is really growing in Canada. And one of the things that we did while I was there, in fact, it was on Friday afternoon, was dedicate a Habitat house for a young family, a single mother with two little girls, the Unrau family. And I spoke to the oldest little girl. She was 11 years old. And I said, Nadine, how do you feel about your new house? And she said, we are so happy. We are just so pleased to be moving in. And she said, you know we're moving in this afternoon, and we're going to spend the night here tonight. I said, yes, Nadine, I'd heard that. And she said, we're going to live here forever and ever. And then her mother, when she spoke, following the receipt of her Bible, which we always present to every new homeowner, we had a house dedication service, a beautiful one here this afternoon. And we presented a Bible to the Unger family in Muncie, your sixth house in this city. But when that young mother spoke, following the presentation of her Bible, with great emotion in her voice, she said, we're going to move in this house, and we're never going to move. She said, we're so tired of moving from one place to the other. Just get settled in, and for one reason or another, we have to move. Now we've got our own place, and we won't ever have to move again. And I often remember a story I shared in church this morning. I spoke at High Street Methodist Church. Three weeks ago, I was in McKinleyville, California. 1,400 Methodists gathered there for a, an event they called Jubilee 92, and 200 of their people built two habitat houses in four days. 
They raised $61,000 to build those two houses, enough for those two houses, and they paid for four houses in the Mescatel Valley in Mexico. But one of the persons who got one of those houses was a young, a young woman named Joanne Waters. Joanne is a single mother. She's got a little boy, eight years old, and one 11 years old. And she's been living in a garage behind somebody's house. No toilet facilities, no kitchen, just a place that was built for automobiles. But that was her home. She was chosen to receive a modest, but a good and a solid and a decent habitat house. She's a waitress. She doesn't make a whole lot of money, especially if she has to support two children. Her husband took off for parts unknown, doesn't help with the support of the children. People had told her that I was coming and that I was a person with Linda who had founded Habitat. So when I appeared on the work site, I was there on the, on the fourth day of a four-day blitz, so they were nearly finished. When she saw me, she ran over and hugged my neck, and she began to weep. She could hardly talk to me. She was so emotional. I was on the site about 30 minutes. She cried the whole time I was there. I talked to the foreman. He said, Millard, she's cried like that for four days. And he said, I want to tell you something. He said, at the end of the first day, we worked all day. Everybody went home. I left. And then I remembered I'd forgotten something. And I came back. It was completely dark. And I walked in to get what I'd left. And I heard a noise, and I went into what was going to be the living room. And there was Joanne sitting in the middle of the floor by herself, just quietly sobbing. We do touch people in this work. And that's why it's so important, reaching out and touching other human beings with love and care and concern. Joanne was so emotional, not only because she was getting a house, but because of the motivation behind her getting a house. When Linda and I lived in Zaire, in Africa, and we were building houses, periodically we would have a family selection committee meeting, and we would choose families. That's always difficult because there's so much need and it's hard to make choices. But we made choices, and one of the families we chose was a man named Mpakamola. And I went out on the construction site. This man was a skilled builder. In fact, he had a, I always said he had a calibrated eyeball because he didn't even need a level. He would put up corners for houses. He was a skilled builder, but he'd always been so poor, he was never able to have a decent house for his own family. He lived in a pitiful shack. And so I saw this man. He was on the construction site. And I walked up to him, and I said, Mpakamola, j'ai la bonne nouvelle pour vous. I have good news for you. Tiens, he said, tiens, qu'est-ce qu'il y a? What is it? I said, votre famille a été choisie d'avoir une belle maison. Your family has been chosen to have a beautiful new habitat house. He just fell over. <laughs> he fell over. I thought I had killed him. <laughs> I looked and I said, what did I do? He slowly got up. He was weeping. He got on his knees and he took my hand in both of his hands, and looking at me square in the face with these tears pouring down both cheeks, he said, merci, merci. And he got up and walked away. Habitat touches people. In 1990, we went with Jimmy Carter to Tijuana, Mexico, and we built the biggest project we've ever built, 100 houses in Tijuana and seven in San Diego in five days. It was called the miracle on the border. On Thursday night of that week, an event happened, which is one of the most dramatic events I've ever experienced in Habitat. It was just about dusk, dark, and we were getting ready to go to sleep in our, in our tents. We had 600 tents set up. 1,200 people were living in 600 tents there on the site. And somebody said, there are lights on the mountain. And people began to come out, and sure enough, we looked at this small mountain off to the, to the side of where we were sleeping, and there were lights all over the top of this mountain. People said, what's that, you know? It wasn't on the program. Everything is planned minute by minute. You know, you got to plan everything minute by minute uh, to build 107 houses in five days. And people said, 
lights on mountaintop is not on the program. But we were so curious, we all came out and we walked over to the valley and we saw the lights begin to come down the mountainside. And somebody said, I think that's the homeowners. And as they began to come closer, we realized that that indeed was the case. About 600 or 700 mamas and papas and boys and girls who were going to live in those hundred houses had all gotten a candle and they'd all gone up to the top of the mountain and they'd lit those candles and they were coming down the mountainside. We went to the bottom of the mountain and they came to us. We got in a huge circle. They piled up, they had piled up a bunch of wood there and they set it on fire, made a huge bonfire. And when they got to us, they came around, they entered the circle and they started going around shaking everybody's hand. And this is what they said, were saying. Thank you for coming to Metamoro Centro. That was their neighborhood. Thank you for coming to Metamoro Centro you have brought hope to our lives. This, too, is what Habitat is about. And finally, I want to read you something that was handed to me in Muskegon, Michigan, in Marquette, Michigan, rather, on Wednesday of this week. It's something which a lady handed to me who has a relative in Louisville, Kentucky. And this is a temple bulletin from from Louisville, and it's about a woman who is the rabbi of this Reformed Jewish congregation, and she has written down what her little five-year-old daughter dictated to her about her feelings about working with Habitat for Humanity in Louisville, Kentucky. Her name is Yale, Y-A-E-L, and here's what this five-year-old Habitat volunteer wrote about her experience of working with Habitat. The very first time I heard about Habitat for Humanity, I, know, I knew I wanted to do it, to help build a house. I wanted to build the city of God. I wanted to be the water girl. But they didn't need it because it was too cold, so no one was hot and thirsty. Lisa and Emery and Jack were there, and lots of other people too. It was everybody from the temple except the ones that it was for who were helping to build their own house and the woman whose house will be built next time they build again. The family was nice. The boy's name was Eric and he talked to me. It was fun to meet the family who was going to live in that house. My mom said, it must be so exciting. And she said, it's more than exciting, it's a blessing. That was a blessing for all the people who came. When we decided to do sanding and we were sanding in a good spot, I wanted to do mudding too. My mom said, you'll get all dirty. But I said, you're supposed to get dirty. You can't really work without getting dirty. So we went upstairs and we did mudding. You have white stuff and something like a spatula and you dip it in a yellow pan with all the white stuff in it, that's the mud, and you spread it all over some bumpy tape until it's all covered. Then you go to another spot. It's kind of hard and it's kind of easy, but you need to get it on the wall all nice and smooth. After, you have to wash your hands in freezing cold water. They have a picture taken of you and then you leave. I want to say how freezing cold the weather was, but inside it made me feel a little warm too. Touching home, touching lives, touching volunteers, touching students, touching the homeowners, that's Habitat for Humanity. Thank you.